Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, I thank uh, the music ministry and all of you who have been sharing about God's faithfulness. It's wonderful how the, we, we have been led by the Holy Spirit this morning, and he's preparing our hearts to receive his word. I want to welcome all the families, especially some Latino families, Latino families that were in Mexico. Welcome back. We are very glad to have you here again. So it's been uh, two weeks since we started this new year. And I would like to ask you, how have you started off this year? Have you started this year with all your trust placed in the Lord, in total dependence on him, and with the peace of God ruling your heart? If so, I thank God for you. But perhaps there is someone who has started this year carrying the burden of the problems from the past and trying to solve them in your own strength, with your own resources. And for that reason, you started this year stressed, worried, overwhelmed, and tired. And it's been only two weeks. It's not God, God's will that you be like this. God wants you to give his joy and his peace to you. Do you have problems? Brothers and sisters, we all have problems to some extent. And on top of them, we as Christians, we face opposition to our faith. There are two things that a mature Christian must understand and accept. The first thing is that in this fallen world, we will have to face many problems and opposition. And the second is that we can trust in the Lord and Savior in the midst of them. We cannot reach maturity in faith unless we understand those two truths of the Word of God. Even when the picture of life, of our life, is not very clear, do the circumstances we go through, through, we can rest in Christ. We can rest in the promises of His Word. God has not promised us a life without difficulties, but He assures us that during adversity and during affliction, we can experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Philippians 4, chapter 7. He has promised not to leave you and not to forsake you. Jesus is a trustworthy Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for who you are, Lord, and we praise you and we give you glory. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning to be ministered by your word. What a joy is it to come before your presence, Lord. Father, we come before you with gratitude. Thank you for your faithfulness, your mercy, and your grace. We ask that you would prepare our hearts and that you would open our spiritual eyes to see the truths on your word. I pray that you would enable me in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to deliver, to deliver this message to this congregation. Speak through me, Lord. May this message be for your glory and for the edification of your church. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. 
So as you can read in your bulletin, the title of this message is A Victorious Life in Christ. And it's my prayer that, that today, through the word of God, we remember that Jesus has overcome and he's in control of the life of each and every one of us who have placed our faith in him. May this preaching bring comfort and hope to believers who are going through difficult times and may it, may it also be an invitation to all those who have not believed in Jesus so that they know that in Christ there is forgiveness of sins and they can take refuge in his mercy and receive the gift of his grace. So we read in John chapter 16, verses, verses 16 to verse 33. And in these verses, we just read that the last words, we just read the last words of our Lord Jesus. Jesus would say to his disciples that words in the upper room before his arrest and his crucifixion. And these words sounded tragic to them. It was confusing to hear that the master would depart from this world, that they would be persecuted and scattered, and that they would have affliction in this world. However, these were not words of discouragement. Note that the last words of these verses are not said in defeat, but in victory. John 16, verse 33. In the world, you will, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. It means trust. I have overcome the world. In John 14, Jesus has already told the, uh, the apostles, John 14, verses 1 to verse 3, and then we will go to verse 27. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Verse 27. Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world give do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus wanted to make his disciples see that he is in control and that everything that was about to happen in chapters 18 and 19 of John 16 including his crucifixion and death, was not a tragedy, but rather a great victory. So through all these uh, verses that we're going to read in John 16, verses, verses 16 to verse 33, I would like us to see three teachings of Jesus. The first one, will be that Jesus loves us. The second is that Jesus is a patient savior. And the third one is that, in, that his victory on the cross secures our peace in any situation or circumstance. So we will focus, as I told you, in, verses, in John 16, verses 25, to verse 33. The first teaching we have is the Father loves us. 
verse 25 says, Jesus tells the disciples in this verse, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In John 16, verses 12 and verse 13, he already told them, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Jesus knew that many of the things he had taught them could be incomprehensible for for the disciples. First, let us remember that the Holy Spirit had not come yet to help them understand. And secondly, it was like a puzzle with missing pieces to them. They were not able to visualize the whole picture of redemption just yet. And sometimes the same thing happens to us when we face problems and then we ask, Lord, what are you doing in my life? I don't know how this problem will help me. Where are you in this situation? These questions arise because like the disciples, We don't see the whole picture. We have not seen the finished puzzle. We do not see what God wants to do in our lives, and we only focus in our circumstances. However, quite often as time goes by, we understand why God put that piece of the puzzle in our life, in that place, and at that moment. And why it was necessary for us to go through this, that specific circumstance. We realize that God did it because he loves us. And he knows that sometimes problems are necessary for us to turn our eyes to Jesus. It was after the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost that the disciples of Jesus began to understand what he had taught them about the Father. And that privileged relationship that we Christians now have with the Father because of the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. So let's continue reading verses 26 and verse 27. In that day, you will ask me, you will ask in my name, and I do not say that you, to you, that I shall pray the the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from God. So in this verse, Jesus confirms the great love of the Father for us. As we love Jesus and believe in him, the Father's love, his mercy, and his grace were poured out on us. God sent Jesus because we are the object of his love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, For God so loved you and me that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is because the the Father loves us. The Father himself chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. 
He chose us to be holy and without blemish before him. In John chapter 4, verses, verse 19, it says that we love him because he first loved us. We also read in John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. If God had waited for us to take the first step, we never would have had any relationship with him. Because there is no one in the world who seeks God in his own initiative. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verses 11 and verse 12. And later in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, says that, the great demonstration, the demonstration, demonstration of God's love is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us and chose us for salvation even when we were not worthy of his love. He still loved us. And we are thankful for that. Before coming to Christ, God loved us with the love of compassion and mercy. And this is the love that we must have for all the people, whether they are believers or not. Remember that there was a time when we didn't love Jesus. We didn't trust or believe in him. But despite that condition, the Lord chose us for salvation. Then we came to Christ. We were born again. And God transformed our hearts by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, our Heavenly Father looks at us through the person of his Son, Jesus and what he did on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. Let's continue in verse 28. John 16, verse 28. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. In this verse, Jesus is explaining to the disciples something they could not understand at that time. That his departure was necessary to complete the work of salvation. He had been sent by the Father to die for us on a cross, and now he had to return to the Father. Remember that we are studying three truths in, in these verses. The first, is, the first one is that the Father loves us. And the second one is that Jesus is a very patient Savior. Let's go to verse 29 and to verse 31. Then the disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe? Jesus replied. Do you now believe? The disciples had evaluated Jesus for his ability to know everything. In verse 30, they said to Jesus, Lord, you know in advance the concerns and questions of the people. And on that basis, we have concluded that you have come from God. 
we could say that the disciples were correct in their conclusion about their master. However, they still could not see the full picture of Jesus' ministry. Jesus knew that, this, that his disciples were not really understanding. So that's why he asked them, do you now believe? And we find a similar situation in John 13. If you want to turn your Bible, John 13, verses 37 to 38. In John 13, verses 37 uh, and verse 38, Peter said to Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So we see that these men, the disciples, here Peter, they had not realized how weak they were. That in the moment of trial, they would all flee. Showing how little they understood the teachings of Jesus. How weak their faith was and how little they knew themselves. Let's read in verse 32. Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, it has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. That's John 16, verse 32. So Jesus knew beforehand that all the disciples would leave him after his arrest. The Lord knew in advance that Peter was going to deny him three times. He knew it already. And the Lord knows beforehand each of our weaknesses and sins, each of our faults. But even so, the Lord instructs the disciples patiently and instructs us with his word, knowing that in due time, his word will bear fruit. He is a patient savior. Jesus is a patient savior, and he can do extraordinary things through ordinary people. When you look at the 12 apostles, and you read about them in the Gospels, their lack of faith, their ignorance, their stubbornness, and their foolishness, we definitely see that this was not the dream team. It was not the team that you would choose to go around the world with the Gospel. However, that was the team that Jesus chose And if the church is still standing, brothers and sisters, it is not because of what anyone has done, but because of what God has done in Christ, and because we have a promise from God written in his word. Matthew 16, verse 18. I will build my church, and the, ha and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus is a powerful savior. He is a patient savior. Who will not leave us. And also, he will not leave his work unfinished. But he will continue to do his work in us, through us, and, and in spite of us. Philippians 1, 
verse 6. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is good to know that we have a patient Savior, a Savior who will never leave us nor forsake us. He is a Savior who will help us through his Spirit to stand up from our faults and to continue to run the race despite of our weaknesses. Jesus is a patient and powerful Savior we can be safe in, his hand, in the hands of him who obtained the final victory on the cross of Calvary. Till now we have seen that the Father loves us and that Jesus is a patient Savior. Now let's continue to the third and last point of this message. Jesus' victory on the cross assures our peace in any situation and circumstance. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This chapter of John 16 concludes with Jesus promising the disciples, the disciples a supernatural peace. Which peace? His own peace. The peace that doesn't depend on the circumstances, but is the peace that depends on what God has done on our behalf, through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And let's not forget the context of these words. Jesus was about to endure the most terrible hours, the most terrible hour of his life. And the apostles were about to see their hope on their promised Messiah shatter before their eyes. The Lord knew it. That's why he had told them all these things. Although the disciples didn't understand it at that moment. Jesus knew that after the cross, they would understand what had really happened. Jesus knew their disciples, that the disciples would experience the promised peace. Jesus was saying to the apostles, all the truths that I have shared with you have a purpose that you may experience true peace in me. Family in Christ, this is part of the inheritance that the Lord left us, his own peace. The peace that ruled Jesus' heart at that very moment before going to the cross. And the more we grow in the understanding of these truths of the gospel and apply them into our lives, the more we will experience that peace. A peace that is so different from that which the world offers us. The peace of Jesus is not one of antidepressants. It's not the peace of material prosperity or one of entertainment and pleasures to help us momentarily forget the problems of life. The peace of Jesus depend, do not depend on any circumstance. The peace of the world depends on, on the circumstances. If things work well for us, we feel good. 
But if they change, if, if things change suddenly, then so does our state of mind. It is amazing how the people of the world change their mood in a second. Do you know why? Because their peace depends on their circumstances. But the peace of Jesus is an inward peace of the soul. A supernatural calm. A stillness of the heart that comes from knowing that God controls all things with the power of his word. It is a peace that comes from the assurance that we have been reconciled with God through the redeeming work of Jesus. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, these promises are for you. And this is the peace he provides to those who, who believe in him. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. Also in Philippians 4, chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in, every, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind, minds through Christ Jesus. Again, Romans 8, 35 and verse 37, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us, through Jesus. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous hand. These promises, if you have put your faith in Jesus, these promises are for you, my brothers. The peace of Jesus is a peace that dissolves fear. It is a peace that allows us to stand up in the midst of the most bitter trials. Brethren, let us not seek peace in the world because we will not find it. The world does not have the power to give us the peace that it's only found in Jesus. The world is rather a real troublemaker and sooner or later we will experience affliction to some extent. In the world, you will have trouble. What happened on the cross of Calvary was not a tragedy. On the contrary, it was the greatest victory that has ever been achieved in the history of the world. That event solved the greatest problem of humanity, our separation from God because of sin. And it was resolved once and for all in Christ Jesus. Jesus overcame sin, overcame disbelief, overcame death, death 
overcame everything that discourages us, everything that depresses us, everything that opposes the gospel, everything that hinders the building of his church. Jesus overcame everything on the cross. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Brothers and sisters, true rest do not come when a problem in life is solved. You know why? Because there will be another problem along the way. True rest come, comes from knowing that Christ, that in Christ we have peace with God. True rest and peace arises in knowing that now you and I we are able to live the life that pleases God because Christ lives in you. True rest arises from a constant hope in God's great salvation. We do not fight for victory. We fight from a victorious position because Christ has already won on the cross. First John chapter five, verses four and verse five. For whatever is born of God overs, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is, verse five, who is he who overcomes the world? Says John, John in this verse. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you have been born again in the family of faith, if you have trusted in, trusted in Christ for the salvation of your soul, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. Your identification with Christ is such that his victory is your victory through faith. Victory is absolute, absolutely true for all who are in Christ. But if that is not your reality this morning, your final defeat is as sure as the final victory of the children of God. There is an eternity before you for good or for bad. And what will make the difference is not your religion, not your moral, not your achievements in life, nor your good deeds. What will make the difference is your relationship with Jesus. Only in him there is salvation. Only in him there is forgiveness of sins. Only in him there is reconciliation. Only in him there is eternal life. Only in him there is victory. So brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and strengthen your faith and may the Holy Spirit Produce faith and repentance in those who have not yet received Christ under, as their Lord and Savior. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of your word, Lord. Thank you because you strengthen our faith with your promises. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that enable us to live through faith in Christ, our victorious Lord and Savior. Thank you because you have been patient, and it is through your mercies that we are not consumed, because your compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father, I ask your blessing upon this congregation. Give us the courage and boldness to proclaim the good news of salvation despite the opposition. 
and give us peace while we await the glorious return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you, if you want to know more about Jesus, about the Christian faith, there will be some people here at the front, at the front willing to pray for you. So, prayer ministry, I, I will ask you to come, come up to the front. So may the Lord bless you. Thank you.